Hey Clicksters, my name is Royce and I'm going to be showing anyone who cares to know how to play horror clicks. Oh, in 2006, the company WizKids came out with a game called Horror Clicks. Uh, it utilizes the same bases as a couple of the other miniature games, such as Hero Clicks and Mage Knight. But Horror Clicks was a little different. It wasn't exactly the same kind of uh, just let's go out and beat each other up kind of thing. They wanted to promote scenarios. And of course, with so many horrific characters, and it's in the name, it was all in a horror theme. It included original characters created by the folks at WizKids, and licensed characters, such as Alien. But most of this can be bought pretty cheaply because the game was discontinued in 2008. So you can find boxes of it for pretty cheap. So around maybe a $40 investment, you can get a set roughly about the size of this. What you will need to play the Horror Clicks game are going to be obviously the miniatures. Different styles, different sizes. With the characters come the character cards that tell you what they can do. Any special abilities. You'll also need dice. These are plot twist cards. They include regular plot twist, a subplot, or ticking clock cards. You'll also need victim pogs, which come in the shape of just these punch out little pieces of cardboard. And lastly, you'll need a map, something to play the game on. To start the game, each player uh, decides on a certain point value and you build around that. Let's say you have a point value of 300 points. Each character on their card and on their base tells you how many points they are worth. Gather your characters together, add up the point values and it must be 300 or less. You want to make sure that your characters are at their starting dial. So the way you do that is on the bottom of the base you just want to click it until you see that green starting line and that'll be their starting value. Every player starts with plot twist cards. You start with six and each one of them is unique so you can't have multiples of the same one and you need six. This is what's considered your crypt. You start the game with them flipped over like this and when you play them, you flip them over, and typically you do what the guard says, and then it goes away never to be used again. But some of these, like subplots, stay up for the entire game, and you can only have one subplot in your crypt. You will also be using victim pogs, which are just little circle cardboard stamped out pieces. You will need 12 in total, so for a two player game, each player would bring six. And all you would do is you'd flip them upside down, scatter them around, and then you'd take turns placing them on the map. On each map are spots where there are blood spots, and that is where you place your victims at the beginning of the game. So when your game is fully set up, it should probably look something like this. With the map in the middle, all your characters set up, your character cards in front of you were easily accessible, your pair of dice, your crypt which features six cards, and these as well. We're using these as action tokens. As we can see we have our victims on the blood spots predetermined by the map, and all of our characters are set up on the starting lines. On the map they need to be in the purple area, so anywhere within these purple lines it's okay to place your characters when you start the game. Let me go over a few basic parts of the map. Maps are typically made up of open terrain, block terrain which features walls, and hindering terrain. Other such terrain would be water terrain. Anything with a green line around it is considered hindering terrain. Unless your character's card says otherwise, once you enter hindering terrain, you have to stop your movement. And 
when you're leaving hindering terrain or if you're in hindering terrain, you half your movement when you leave or when you're walking through it. This would be considered blocking terrain because it's a wall. Anything with a black border around it is considered a wall and you cannot move through it just like here, that is blocked. You cannot move through it. Sometimes this is also shown with a brown border, but it's not applicable on this map. Before the game begins, each player will reveal any subplot cards that they have in their crypt. Again, you can have one per crypt. Once you reveal your subplot card, you will read it out loud to the other player and explain what the rules are, and then try to accomplish those goals based on what the card is saying. Some key concepts to keep in mind about the game is that the predetermined point value that be, you begin with doesn't, doesn't determine how many characters you can use. This one team is made up of 300 points but features 5 characters because you're going off of the numbers that their point value is. 70 points here, 40 points here, 100 points here. Whereas this team is made up of 4 characters because that's what their point values will represent. 65 points, 125 points, 40 points, and 70 points. Each 100 points of the point value will determine how many actions you get per turn. In a 300 point game, you get 3 actions per turn. There are 3 actions you can do on your turn. You have a move action in which you can move up to the printed move value. The executed convict has a movement of 4, so he can move 4 through clear terrain. You can make a close combat attack, which I will go into attacking later, in which you roll the dice to see if you make a hit or not. Or, you can make a ranged combat attack. Right here where you see this lightning bolt, you can see it has a range of 4 and can hit targets up to 4 tar spaces away. 1, 2, 3, and he could do more if he wanted to, if he has line of sight. Players will roll the dice to determine who has the first turn. A turn is comprised of 4 phases. The first phase is known as the preview phase, in which you will reveal any ticking clock cards that you have in your crypt. You can only reveal one each preview phase and any game effects will be resolved if they need to be. The second phase is known as the suspense phase in which the player will get to choose one of the victims face down, move them face up, and will move them up to their move value. Each one has a move value and you get to move it up to that move value. So four will go one, two, three, four. Before you move one, the other player may choose to play a card of, in his crypt that affects his movement or affects what that victim does. Or you get, to, you get to play one of your cards to determine what that victim does or doesn't do. After the suspense phase comes the hunting phase. That's when you get to move your monsters. Now, like I said, in a 300 point game, you're going to get three actions per turn. So in this case, I would be able to move three of my monsters. I'll move Hellboy, who has a speed value of 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. He's going to stop his movement when he gets to the victim because he has not slain the victim like an evil character would do. He has rescued this victim. All that means is you take the victim's paw and you put it on Hellboy's card and it lets you know that he has rescued that victim. Now. If you are trying to rescue or slay a victim, the other player may play a card that prevents that from happening and may do damage to your character. Another thing that gets done during the hunting phase is you can give one of your characters a close combat action in which he will make an attack against an opposing character or like I said a ranged combat in which the same thing happens only it's from a range of whatever the printed range value is. Both of these guys have a range value of zero and so can only make close combat attacks unless otherwise changed by cards in your crypt. The very last phase is known as the hourglass phase because some characters have hourglass symbols on their different values whether it be speed value, their 
uh, attack value, their defense value, or their damage value. Basically, during the hourglass phase, you're going to click your character once, so where it's past that one hourglass phase. When a character has an hourglass on a printed value, like let's say his movement has that hourglass, he will not be able to move this turn, and he will not be able to attack this turn. But, because he has something on his defense, he can still be attacked. The hourglass phase, you will simply just take this character and you will click him one more time. And now he is on that click. And that will successfully end your turn and it will be the next player's turn. A reason why tokens might be useful, especially in a game like this, is that every time you, you move your character, it uses one of your actions. So in order to remember who just did an action on the last turn, you can use something like a poker chip. Some people use the little beads, some people use dice as well to show how many actions they have. But it, all it does is show you who moved last turn. If I moved him there as well, I will just place an action token so it lets me know and it lets my opponent know who I just moved on my last turn. On your next turn, if one of your characters has a token already on him, or if he did an action last turn, he will not be able to make an action this turn. So at the end of your turn, you will just remove that so he'll be able to go next turn. The concept is a little confusing at first, but with frequent play, it's easy. Let me go ahead and take this time to explain how combat is done. As you can see, every character has an attack value. The attack value is represented by that claw. The bear has an attack value of 10, while the convict has an attack value of 8. If the bear is going to attack the convict, he will roll his two dice. He would add the result of the dice to his 10, and it has to be better than his defense value of 16. So all the bear needs in order to make a hit against the convict is a 6 or better. We'll roll our dice. That is a 5. And that is a 1. That is 6. 10 plus 6 is 16, so the attack hits. The bear does a damage of 3. So theoretically, the convict would have to click his dial 3 spaces to reveal his new values. But, every character on their character card explains what, different, uh, the, what the different colors represent. On his defense, he has an orange. Well, if we look on his card, the orange says damage dealt to this monster is reduced by 2. The monster is not vulnerable when it has 2 action tokens on it. So instead of taking 3 clicks like the bear would normally do, the convict's only going to take 1 click because 3 minus 2 is 1. Now a ranged combat is exactly like a close combat action, only the characters not adjacent to one another. Hellboy has a range value of 6, which means that he can attack characters that are 6 spaces away and are not blocked by walls or other characters. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, and so he can make a shot against the officer. The officer has a range value of 4, right next to the lightning bolt. So. One, two, three, four. And so if he wanted to make a ranged combat against Hellboy, he could. Exactly like last time, we take their attack values. Hellboy has an attack value of 10. The officer has a defense value of 15. So all Hellboy would need is a five or better in order to make the attack. And once again, you want to look at your character's cards to see if they have any special abilities that affect this. You also want to look at your crypt cards as well because sometimes you can play a crypt card that changes this outcome. Some important concepts to know about combat is you cannot attack somebody else if they are standing on the other side of a wall. Even if they are within range, they still can't have be attacked unless it says otherwise on their card. Remember, you always want to revert to what the card says first before what the rules say. Same as moving. You cannot move through walls. You have to move around them. You cannot move through... 
opposing characters either. The wrestler can move like this with no problem, but if he moves here and then here, he must stop, no matter what. And to move away, he has to roll for breakaway. A 1 through 3 dice roll will result in him not being able to break away, which the wrestler does not want. But, on a result of 4, 5, or 6, he gets to move and run away from the alien queen. In the game, there are things that are known as critical misses and critical hits. When rolling your combat, if you wind up rolling two sixes with these dice represented by two skulls, that is known as a critical hit. So on top of the damage that you're already doing, you're going to do one additional damage that cannot be reduced. So here, if this alien reptoid were to hit on this carny, Bloody Tom, with a critical hit, instead of the two damage like his damage is printed, he would do three damage with one of those damages not being able to be uh, defended against. Now, on the other side of the spectrum, if reptoid, the alien, were to roll two ones, that would be known as a critical miss. When you get a critical miss and you're the attacker, no matter if it's enough to do enough damage, the attack has failed and instead you get one damage dealt towards yourself, which you cannot prevent. Characters will stay on the map until they show either the three skulls, which is traditional for horror clicks, or the three KOs, which is traditional for hero clicks, because in the comic books, they never die. Oh, why do we want to slay victims? Well, a couple of reasons. Each time you slay a victim, it earns you 25 victory points. And depending on the game and how you're playing it, the, the winner will be decided by victory points. So you want to slay as many victims as possible, or rescue as many as possible. Now, another reason why you want to do this, you have slain or rescued a victim then your monster is what is known as blooded and once it's blooded it can frenzy frenzy will allow you to do two actions for the price of one the fiend is blooded if he didn't move this last turn let's say it's his next turn and he doesn't have an action token he can move up to his speed value which is printed as four one, two, three, four, and as a free action, he can make an attack against Hellboy. So you would roll as normally and then resolve it that way. The only difference is that when you are frenzying, your damage value becomes one, unless otherwise modified by the special powers on the monster's card. In a typical game, a player is determined the winner when they have eliminated all the other characters except for their own. Or, after a certain amount of time, whoever has the highest number of victory points wins. Or, if you make your own special rules and those rules have been achieved. Overall, what I can say about this game is that it can be a lot of fun. Uh, now, one drawback is that it can get to a point where it gets a little boring to where all you're doing is you're down to a couple of characters who are just sitting there rolling the dice after one another to see who gets what and who gets the first hit in. Um, but that's what I like about the special scenarios. So if you were to play it, it'd be best to get familiar with the rules. You can go online, you can visit www.boardgamegeek.com and just search for horror clicks and there's a great PDF that shows every single rule you're going to know. The most important thing is to read the cards because all the cards are going to determine what your characters can and can't do. It's a good social game uh, as with any miniatures game because it requires a lot of communication with the other players and picking up their pieces, seeing what their attacks, what their defense is, looking at their cards, uh, so, so it's a good way to socialize as well, or it can be a good way. Uh, maybe for a game like this, maybe not so much, just because it is discontinued. Uh, it's, it's about four years old now and only getting older and only getting cheaper. 
But if you're a horror fan like myself and you like little miniatures, little collectible miniatures, this game is worth a try. It's, it's, it's cheap get, to get into and it can be a lot of fun. Uh, again, I'm not describing all the rules for full detail of all the rules. You might want to go online, check out that PDF, and the best thing to do is just buy some of it and jump right into it. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this tutorial. And if you do like it, make sure you like it. Make sure you ask, you can ask me any questions in the comment section. I will answer them. I'm familiar with most of the rules, but if not, I will look them up for you. Until next time.